Hello again. I am Phyllis Auric, and I couldn't help sharing another Dickens favorite of mine. For this, the 2020 pandemic, Dickens to Go, created by the Dickens Project at UC Santa Cruz. This time, I would like to talk about Barnaby Rudge, the character who I believe Dickens felt very fondly about, contrary to his assertions about Barnaby's lack of a soul or human agency. I understand that Barnaby Rudge, the novel, was the subject of the 2019 Dickens universe. Sadly, I was not able to attend because, well, I didn't discover the Dickens project until after it had taken place. Among Dickens' novels, Barnaby Rudge is considered an anomaly of sorts because it is one of two historical novels he wrote, the other being A Tale of Two Cities. I would posit that it stands out for another reason, a more compelling one to my mind, it is built around a character who represents the purest version of the ideal of the boy child slash son that Dickens so often alludes to with obvious affection throughout his works. The young Weller in the Pickwick Papers being but one example, though that portrayal and others throughout his work do not does not rise to the level of complexity and significance that Dickens confers on Barnaby Rudge, who in the end Dickens presents as the ultimate innocent. Much is made in the novel and in analyses of it of Barnaby's idiocy, lack of wit, and less than human status, and Dickens lets drop observations early on that appear to endorse this view of Barnaby. The first time Dickens presents Barnaby, he is looking on the stricken form of Ned Chester, who has been wounded by Barnaby's father, unbeknownst to all involved. The locksmith Barden, on his way home to London, comes across the scene and gets the information out of Barnaby as best he can about what has happened. Dickens opines about Barnaby, but the absence of the soul is far more terrible in a living man than in a dead one, and in this unfortunate being, its noblest powers were wanting, making him less than human in a profound way. However, in the paragraphs that come before, Dickens seems to imply that Barnaby is not wanting in some powers. Varden asks Barnaby if Barnaby knows him, and Barnaby nods, albeit a score of times, and with a fantastic exaggeration, that would have kept his head in motion for an hour, but that the locksmith held up his finger and fixing his eyes sternly to, upon him caused him to desist. Young Chester observes that his attacker resembled the stranger who had been at the Maypole earlier, Barnaby's father. Varden exclaimed, what dark history is this? At which moment a hoarse voice, voice cries out. The speaker who made the locksmith start as if he had seen some supernatural agent was a large raven. Barnaby's pet raven, Grip who is Barnaby's adjunct intelligence. Grip had perched upon the top of an armchair unseen by Varden and Edward and listened with a polite attention and a most extraordinary appearance of comprehending every word to all they had said up to this point, turning his head from one to the other as if his office were to judge between them and if it were of the very last importance he should not lose a word. Look at him, said Varden, divided between admiration of the bird and a kind of fear of him. Was there ever such a knowing imp as that? Oh, he's a dreadful fellow. The raven, with his head very much on one side and his bright eyes shining like a diamond, preserved a thoughtful silence for a few seconds. And then he replied in a voice so hoarse and distant that it seemed to come through his thick feathers than, rather than out of his mouth. Oh, 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 no, what's the matter here? Keep up your spirits, never say die. Bow, wow, wow, I'm a devil, I'm a devil, I'm a devil, hurrah! And then, as if exulting in his infernal character, he began to whistle. I more than half believe he speaks the truth. Upon my word, I do, said Barton. Do you see how he looks at me, as if he knew what I was saying? To which the bird, balancing himself on tiptoe, as it were, and moving his body up and down in a sort of grave dance, rejoined, I'm a devil, I'm a devil, I'm a devil, and flapped his wings as if he were bursting with laughter. Barnaby clapped his hands and fairly rolled on the ground in an ecstasy of delight. Strange companion, sir, said the locksmith, the bird has all the wit. Whereupon young Chester holds out a finger to grip with, who goes after it with his iron bill. Varden tells Barnaby to call him down, which implicitly gives Barnaby more wit than the raven, but Barnaby won't accept his superiority to the bird. He calls me and makes me go where he will. He goes on before, and I follow. He's the master, and I'm the man. Is that the truth, Grip? The raven gave a short, comfortable, confidential kind of croak, a most expressive croak, which seemed to say, you needn't let these fellows into our secrets. We understand each other is all right. On second thoughts, the bird appeared disposed to come of himself. 
After a short survey of the ground and a few sidelong looks at the ceiling and at everybody present in turn, he fluttered to the floor and went to Barnaby, not in a hop or walk or run, but in a pace like that of a very particular gentleman with exceedingly tight boots on trying to walk fast over loose pebbles. Then, stepping into his extended hand and condescending to be held out at arm's length, he gave vent to a succession of sounds, not unlike the drawing of some eight or ten dozen of long corks, and again asserted his brimstone birth and parentage with great distinctness. The locksmith shook his head, perhaps in some doubt of the creature's being really nothing but a bird, perhaps in pity for Barnaby, who by this time had him in his arms and was rolling about with him on the ground. The affinity between Barnaby and Grip that Dickens portrays so sympathetically in such appreciative detail derives from Dickens's own appreciation for ravens, as he explains in the second preface to the novel, which he added on top of the first one. The raven in this story is a compound of two great originals, Dickens explains, of whom I have been at different times the proud possessor. The first was in the bloom of his youth when he discovered was discovered in a modest retirement in London by a friend of mine and given to me. He had from the first, as Sue Hibben, Evans says of Anne Page, good gifts, which he improved by study and attention in a most exemplary manner. He slept in a stable, generally on horseback, and so terrified a Newfoundland dog by his preternatural sagacity that he has been known, by mere superiority of his genius, to walk off unmolested with the dog's dinner before his face. He was rapidly gaining in acquirements and virtues when, in an evil hour, his stable was newly painted. He observed the workmen closely, saw that they were careful of the paint, and immediately burned to possess it. On their going to dinner, he ate up all they had left behind, consisting of a pound or two of white lead, and this youthful indiscretion terminated in death. While I was yet inconsolable for his loss, another friend of mine in Yorkshire discovered an older and more gifted raven at a village public house, which he prevailed upon the landlord to part with for a consideration and sent up to me. The first act of this sage was to administer to the effects of his predecessor by disinterring all the cheese and halfpence he had buried in the garden, a work of immense labor and research, to which he devoted all the energies of his mind. When he had achieved this task, he applied himself to the acquisitions of stable language, in which he soon became such an adept that he would perch outside my window and drive imaginary horses with great skill all day. He had not the least respect, I'm sorry to say, for me in return or for anybody but the cook. One Dickens' affection and anthropomorphism of his raven shows that he has much more sympathy and understanding of Barnaby's attachment to Grip and suggests that Dickens may feel Barnaby is not wanting as much as the characters Dickens has created think Barnaby is. This wouldn't be the first or last time that over the course of a book, Dickens' attitude toward a character changes while the attitudes of his creations remain constant. The five-year gap that Dickens inserts in this story comes to an end for each set of characters. For Barnaby. for Barnaby himself, the time which had flown had passed him like the wind. The daily suns of years had shed no brighter gleam of reason on his mind. No dawn had broken on his long, dark night. He had, however, the wit to learn how to plant the star that earned them the pittance needed to keep them fed, and while doing the work would listen to stories his mother would repeat over and over to keep him in her sight. The tale of yesterday was new upon the morrow, but he liked them at that moment, and when the humor held him, would remain patiently within doors, hearing her stories like a little child, and working cheerfully from sunrise until it was too dark to see. But he would also at times resume his wandering with Grip and the neighbor's dog. The language Dickens uses to describe Barnaby's rambles belies a dark interpretation of Barnaby's mental state Dickens often offers in the opening of the chapter. Again, it feels as if he is talking to some unseen audience in one instance and letting himself fully indulge in the joys of Barnaby's way of living in the other. Their pleasures and excursions were simple enough. A crust of bread and scrap of meat with water from the brook or spring sufficed for their repast. Barnaby's enjoyments were to walk and run and leap till he was tired, then to lie down in the long grass or by the growing corn or in the shade of some tall tree, looking upward at the light clouds as they floated over the blue surface of the sky and listening to the lark as she pulled out, poured out her brilliant song. There were wildflowers to pluck, the bright red poppy, the gentle harebell, the cowslip and the rose, 
There were birds to watch, fish, ants, worms, hares, or rabbits as they darted across a distant pathway in the wood, and so were gone. Millions of living things to have an interest in, lie in wait for, and clap hands and shout in memory of when they had disappeared. In default of these, or when they wearied, there was the merry sunlight to hunt out as it crept in a slant through leaves and boughs of trees and hid far down, deep, deep, deep in hollow places, like a silver pool where nodding branches seemed to bathe and sport sweet scents of summer air breathing over fields beans or clover, the perfume of wet leaves or moss, the life of waving trees and shadow always changing. When these or any of them tired or in excess of pleasure tempted him to shut his eyes, there was slumber in the midst of all these soft delights, with gentle wind murmuring like music and ears, and everything around melting into one delicious dream. And that is my appreciation of Barnaby Rudge. Thank you for listening. <laughs>